just care about the French Revolution. Uh, we should care because the French Revolution shaped the political world in which Marxism developed. It was the first real mass movement in modern history, and it was the decisive political conflict in the birth of the modern bourgeois world. We must understand it in order to understand how it formed in order to know how to dismantle it. So absolutism uh, leading up to the revolution, France was an absolute monarchy. Uh, King Louis XVI ruled by divine right. Feudalism was the mode of production, though the first whispers of capitalism were on the horizon. Feudalism was highly decentralized and hugely inefficient. There were a series of crises that threatened the existing order throughout the 14th uh, to 16th centuries, such as the Black Death, the Hundred Year War, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, the Thirty Years War, waves and waves of peasant revolts, and finally the Fronde uh, was a civil war fought by nobles rebelling against centralization. Absolutism was the response to these crises. It reasserted the power of the monarchy. It curbed the power of local lords. It created the beginnings of a centralized state and national economy, and it incorporated the growing bourgeois class into bureaucratic positions. The, mostly these were merchants and those involved with trade. It's kind of the beginning of the bourgeois class. So France was organized into three estates. Uh, the first estate was the clergy at the very top. Obviously, the king was above all of these, but the clergy was the top estate. The second was the nobles, and the third estate was everyone else. The first estate, uh, the clergy, um, so the Catholic Church had huge control of France at the time. They paid almost no taxes. The upper echelon were bishops and whatnot, and they were super rich and they mixed with the nobility, while the lower echelon were super poor, uh, often parish priests who were no better off than the peasants that they served. The second estate was the nobility. They paid almost no taxes and they were divided into two groups, the nobility of the sword, which descended from feudal rulers and ranged from super rich to super in debt. Some were heavily involved in trade and merged with the bourgeoisie. So really a variety of wealth in there. And then the nobility of the robe, which basically bought their noble status from the king so that they would buy their way into social privilege and tax exemptions. And they were mostly comprised of the bourgeoisie and they often administered complex feudal laws. And then the third estate was everyone else. They paid all the taxes and it included many different classes. So you had some bourgeois like trade merchants, industrialists, you had professionals, lawyers, doctors, civil servants, you had petty bourgeois who uh, had a much bigger uh, impact at that time than, than today. There were small merchants, artisans, shopkeepers, and then you had wage earners that were starting to crop up in the towns and cities. And then you had peasants who had land and equipment and animals who were fairly well off, all the way down to landless peasants and sharecroppers who were abjectly poor. So class struggle arises. Um, France is hugely divided. It speaks several different languages. There's no standardized legal codes, no standardized measurements, everything's super localized. There's a super disorganized tax system. There's customs and barriers everywhere, which makes it really difficult for bourgeois merchants to conduct trade. The bourgeoisie and the peasants alike resent this. They hate bearing the brunt of the taxes and all the feudal dues. Taxation was super heavy and the price of bread was really volatile. At the time, the economy was not so much focused on um, production, but consumption. So the price of bread, you can really see like as the price of bread uh, goes up, the revolutionary fervor goes up throughout the years that we're talking about. There's kind of a direct relationship there. And then the petty bourgeois, the sans culotte um, in particular, they resented this, bearing the brunt of this. So there's a lot of, um, I can't really like point, but if you see between the nobility and then the peasant serfs and the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie are kind of in between the, they're in the third estate, but they're really, you know, they have a uh, struggle from below and struggle from above because they're, they're above the peasants and the serfs, they're the, below, below the nobility. So they have class antagonism going in both directions. And there's really a lot of class conflict going on between that um, third estate and between the first and third, first and second estates above them. So what conditions led to the French Revolution? The, uh, France was in crisis. Political structures were not in step with rival powers um, or the trade of rival countries. They lost the Seven Years' War. Because of that, they were heavily in debt. Then they aided the War of Independence in the US, which further drained their funds. The monarchy's attempts at reform totally didn't work. They were incompatible with the existing social structures, so they couldn't work. And then faith in the monarchy plummeted at the same time that the price of bread skyrocketed and famine was widespread. Famine is always a recipe for a revolution. 
Uh, Cologne, the finance minister who really wanted reforms, uh, but the king wouldn't comply, said France at present is impossible to govern, which pretty much sums it up. So the king, uh, he summoned the estates general in an attempt to resolve these woes, which hadn't been done for more than 150 years. It was a huge to do. Um, it comprised, the estates general was comprised of the three assemblies, one from each estate. And uh, there are questions over whether the estates should meet separately or together. Louis and the nobility obviously adamantly wanted them to stay separate. Uh, and the subjugation of the third estate, which was all the bourgeois, they, uh, you know, it was made clear that they were subjugated to these other two estates. This had the unintended effect of igniting dialogue all over France about what should be done to solve uh, France's problems. And the resentment among the bourgeoisie and the peasantry of the third estate intensified, pamphlets started circulating. There was a lot of coffee drinking going around at the time and a lot of cafes. So people are drinking lots of coffee, getting really aggro, reading all these pamphlets. Peasants were revolting, chateaux were under attack. And um, many of the poorer clergy who were outnumbering the bishops of the first estate, those poor uh, parish priests, they were allied with the third estate and they shared these grievances. So um, the third estate was frustrated with the old feudal structures being flaunted in their face. They were pissed that the estates weren't meeting together. They were angry that their grievances weren't be taken seriously. They declared themselves, they decided to declare themselves a national assembly. Um, they were locked out of their usual meeting place on June 20th. 1789 and so they decided to find a nearby nearby indoor tennis court and they marched inside and decided to meet there instead and here they took an oath not to disperse until a constitution was granted insurrection was brewing the king wouldn't budge on having the three estates meet together um, thousands marched on the palace at Versailles and the royal troops refused to open fire on them, which was a decisive um, indication that the troops were really on the side of the, the insurrectionists at that point. Um, people like Georges Danton were giving speeches, stirring people up, and uh, then Louis ch sacked his chief minister um, as a sign he would not accept any reforms. Rumors started spreading that the king had summoned 20,000 troops to crush the defiance. And then fear really spread of this, you know, backlash by the king. And so crowds began searching for weapons, which led to the storming of the Bastille. Uh, so um, 30,000 muskets were seized by these roving crowds looking for weapons, but muskets aren't very good use without gunpowder and they knew where to find it. The Bastille fortress was a hated symbol of despotism. Um, as a prison, it only housed actually seven prisoners at the time. Um, including the Marquis de Sade, um, but the, the crowds knew that the Bastille's guns could uh, wreak havoc if they were used, so that was the other concern. Um, the crowd decided to preempt any real or imagined attacks by attacking the fortress themselves. So early in the morning on the 14 juillet, or the 14th of July, which would be tomorrow, the anniversary is tomorrow, uh, the angry crowd approached the Bastille, and a few bourgeois were uh, sent in to negotiate with the Marquis de Lonay, uh, who was the governor of the Bastille. But the crowds got really impatient. They sensed a trap. So they started to move to the courtyard. The defending troops opened fire. 98 were killed. Two mutinous regiments defected. And that really uh, turned the tides in the directions of the crowd. The Marquis de Lonay was killed and his head was paraded around on a pike. And the insurrection had won and the revolution had begun. And then we have the great fear and the abolition of feudalism. So news of the Bastille spread all across France. Rural revolts swelled in response. There were chateaux that were burned, tax rolls, deeds, ledgers of all the feudal dues were all burned. And then rumors started spreading even more about um, this fear of backlash by, by the, backlash by the aristocracy. Um, and the peasants were really afraid of this. The backlash didn't come, but it did impel the insurrectionists to get organized and to defend themselves. And that organization that they did then really um, endured throughout the rest of the revolution. Meanwhile, on August 4th, the National Assembly voted to abolish the feudal system. And they came up with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. So uh, it was inspired by Thomas Jefferson, who happened to be in Paris at the time, and General Lafayette, who had fought in the US Revolutionary War, based largely on the philosophers of enlightenment, Rousseau, Locke, uh, et cetera, established a new order based on the interests of the bourgeoisie. So it was very much a bourgeois document. Um, and the three cornerstones of it, uh, which have been a part of um, the French uh, principles of democracy or whatever, bourgeois democracy ever since, were liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Liberty meant freedom from property ownership, 
a freedom of property ownership, rather, free trade, free speech, freedom from arbitrary arrest, etc. Equality meant before the law did not extend to slave colonies, slaves in colonies. And brotherhood um, meant the unified nation state and also the unity of the market. So class antagonisms were temporarily blurred under this new patriotism. The October days in the Marshall on Versailles. So uh, forced, he was forced to back down, but Louis would not accept these changes. He began plotting a counter-revolution under the guise of a dinner party um, in October. Uh, leaders like Danton and Desmoulins urged against the king um, before the royalists gained the upper hand. They were very worried about counter-revolution. On the 5th of October, the women of Paris, uh, they got a bunch of um, weapons uh, and marched to Versailles, broomsticks, pitchforks, etc. And they made the royal family come to Paris with them where they could keep a closer watch on um, the royal family to make sure that uh, counter-revolution was not being plotted. And the nobility and the clergy at this point pretty much fled uh, France to go plot their revenge from abroad. And then the left got really organized. So for the next two years, the revolutionary bourgeoisie made it this really protracted attempt to try to compromise with the king and the nobility with little success. However, at the same time, political organization blossomed. There was um, the formation of all these clubs and sections, a lot of direct democracy going on. Um, what would later become the Jacobin Club started to form with Robespierre and Marat. And the press likewise mushroomed with many of these clubs reading newspapers aloud at their meetings and encouraging political debate. Meanwhile, the king and family decided to try to escape to Varennes, um, or they got caught in Varennes, rather. They were trying to escape to, um, you know, meet up with their um, emigres abroad um, in hopes that they could uh, plot their return to power. But they were discovered by a village postmaster who recognized the king. This would prove a fatal decision on the king's part. It really showed his lack of support for the new revolutionary government, and it fueled fears of counter-revolution. At the Champ du Mar, there were calls for the kings to be dethroned. It was met with gunfire, 50 were killed, um, and the royal flight threw the assembly into political chaos as they debated, what do we do about the king? This led to the dissolution of the National Assembly and the emergence of a new constitution and a new legislative assembly. So the saint culotte and the Enragé, um, both radical petty bourgeois, um, the saint culotte were named because um, they had a habit of wearing their pants buttoned to their coats. So saint culotte means not without pants. <laughs> and the Enragé literally translates as madmen. They begin to articulate clear political demands. Their biggest demand was price controls or maximums. Um, they were very concerned obviously with the price of bread and with other commodities. Um, while they had really different interests than the bourgeois Jacobins, for now they formed an uneasy alliance um, between the two. And uh, so it was really the popular movement and the Jacobin um, bourgeoisie uh, working together. Um, and the Jacobins understood that for the most part, you needed both in order to have a successful revolution. You needed both the popular movement and the bourgeois uh, class also um, involved. But these irreconcilable tensions would obviously surface throughout the rest of the, of the revolution and um, not be wholly resolved. Um, let's see, okay. So with counter-revolution brewing at home, um, mostly in the Vendée and Brittany, and then also abroad, um, the anti-revolutionary sentiment was really fomenting among the emigrated nobility and the non-juring priests, who were those who would um, refuse to swear their allegiance to the new revolutionary order. And so the debate started to rise on the question of should France go to war? Ironically, the Jacobins didn't want to go to war, um, yet the advent of war allowed them to come to power. And Robespierre said, basically, like, we're in such dire straits, you know, shit is so crazy here at home, we can't go to war, my dudes. <laughs> and then the Girondins said, but war will make us rich. Like, think of all the war loans and supply contracts. We're going to get stupid, stupid rich off that. So in April 1792, war was declared on Austria and Prussia. And Marie Antoinette leaked plans to the enemy. So it went very badly at first. And, and that was exactly as Robespierre predicted. Um, and yeah. The war went very badly. Uh, the political backlash was huge because the war uh, really went badly. And the Girondins didn't want to carry through with the war that they had started. They pivoted right, then they pivoted left. In July of 1792, the National Guard troops from the provinces, the Federes, they marched to Paris to demand a new French Republic. On the 29th, everything came to a head at the Tuileries. Um, there was armed struggle between the Royalists and the Revolutionaries. 600 Royalists, 390 Revolutionaries were killed, and the Saint-Culottes and the Federes demanded the King surrender his troops. 
The assembly voted to suspend the king and recognize the insurrectionary commune of Paris. Robespierre was elected to the legislative assembly and the Prussians were winning the war and fear spread of the terrible fate that would befall the revolutionaries if they reached Paris. And so this spread, this fear spreading led to the September massacres. Um, hysteria really swelled. And in just a few days at the beginning of September, half of the prison population of Paris was summarily executed in order to squash any potential conspiracies for the king and nobility to reassert power. Um, estimates of around, you know, 1,000 to 1,600 uh, killed in just a few days. Priests, women, and children, uh, women and girls uh, were raped. Heads were paraded around on pikes, um, including the Princesse de Lamballe, who was the dear confidant of Marie Antoinette. It was a major sign. Uh, and Danton, the Minister of Justice, did nothing to stop the violence. There's, uh, there's the Princesse de Lamballe on a pike there. Um, the Republic was now formed. So the uh, internal threats, with internal threats of counter-revolution squashed temporarily, attention was turned to the external threats. And uh, the Battle of Valmy on uh, the 20th of December was a decisive battle. France won. Things started to look a little better. Um, elections for universal male suffrage took place, and it was marking the political, political significance of the se Second Revolution. And at this time, the monarchy was abolished and the Republic was declared. The revolutionary calendar began with year one, and the Legislative Assembly goes for yet another rebrand with the name the National Convention. But class divisions in the Legislative Assembly were emerging. So you had the Girondins, which were the richer layer of the bourgeoisie. They didn't want limits to wealth. They didn't want economic controls. They wanted unrestricted private property rights. Uh, they had less alliances with the popular movement. They were friendlier to the old social order and they wanted to start war. Didn't want to finish it though. And they had a hard time figuring out who to ally with. Then you had the Jacobins or the Jacobins. Uh, they were more petty bourgeois and uh, they were also called the Montagnards because they tended to occupy the upper seats of the convention. So um, like the mountain. Uh, they were more in favor of economic controls. They wanted some limits to wealth. They wanted some limits to private property ownership. Um, they were more allied with popular movements, as I talked about with the um, sans culottes and whatnot, and Roger. And they were hostile to the old order. They were in favor of centralization. They were super into Jean-Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> they really liked Rousseau a lot, all of his philosophies and whatnot. And they wanted to end the war. And then you had the marsh or the plain or the frogs. They came by different names, but Basically, the rest of the convention was named the Marsh um, or the Plain because they were between these two poles of the Jardin and the Jacobin. And they were also called the Frogs because they were always vacillating, hopping, hopping back and forth between positions based on whatever was most politically expedient to their interests at a given time. And then uh, King Louis was executed. He was tried by convention, the convention and found guilty. Uh, the Girondins tried to maneuver for a stay of execution, but the Jacobins exposed the fact that they were trying to maneuver for this, made it very public because, you know, that was not a popular um, position to have, um, which basically pressured the Girondins into voting for Louis' execution. So on the 21st of January in 1793, he was condemned and guillotined and news of the Girondins' vacillation did not bode well. MRJ called for purging the Girondins from the convention. The working class attempted to push through some demands, but without bourgeois backing, they failed. And the Jacobins secured price fixing of bread, which went, won them popular support and uh, deepened popular hatred of the Girondins. So civil war, foreign war, lots of war. Revolts broke out among royalists in the Vendée region, as well as Lyon, Marseille, Normandy. Um, a lot of provincial peasants were really much more loyal to the church and less um, adversely affected by the old order than their Parisian counterparts. So they really went to the side of the royalists in many cases. Um, the British took over Toulon in the south, the Austrians took the north, uh, the Girondins attempt counter-revolutionary alliances, which is, they go so far as to rally for the creation of constitutional monarchy. The Jacobins channel all of that popular hatred for the Girondins into a consolidation of their power. And then the Girondin, kind of a final attempt, they tried to actually try Marat by the Revolutionary Tribunal. Marat was, of course, acquitted. He was wildly popular and he was paraded through the streets triumphantly. This totally backfired for the Girondin. They were purged from the convention and their deputies were exiled. And the Jacobin were now super in power. But things didn't go well for Marat for very long because then he was assassinated. 
Um, there was a, a young royalist, Charlotte Corday, who was a Girondin. She blamed Marat for the September massacres. Marat had a paper called the Amis du Peuple, the Friends of the People, where he wrote like a lot of fairly incendiary stuff. So she blamed him for the September massacres, for all the violence. And so she pretended to have uh, a list of like counter-revolutionary conspirators that she was going to give him. So he said, yeah, 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 come and show me. And then um, Moraz spent most of his time in a bathtub because he had a skin condition. And so uh, Corday went and stabbed him uh, to death in his tub. She was immediately arrested and executed and Mara became an instant martyr. And then the reign of terror really begins. Um, Robespierre and the Jacobins created a revolutionary government. The Marsh knew where their bread was buttered, so they aligned themselves with them. A new constitution, another one, was created uh, that incorporated many of the populists' demands. And the constitution was, as soon as it was created, it was put on hold because they needed to focus on the war effort. So the levé or the draft was instituted, around 1 million were conscripted. With the war and the counter-revolution still super serious, the Committee on, of Public Safety was formed to send a message to anyone hostile to the revolution. Uh, the sense culotte pushed for price controls and terror, and the reign of terror begins. So I call this the counter-counter-revolution. <laughs> Uh, in September of 1793, the Law and Suspects was passed. Um, committees were set up for, you know, watching any for any kind of anti-revolutionary conspiracies, kind of like witch hunt sort of um, uh, ambiance in the air. In October, Marie, Ant Marie Antoinette was guillotined, um, and around 40,000 were executed during the terror. Magar, whose uh, article we read for this meeting, he argues that the terror was actually not so much about you know, it wasn't about like blood and, and you know, this bloodthirsty kind of motivation as much as it was the war effort that they needed to confiscate property in order to support the war. Um, so, and then during the winter from 1793 to 1794, thousands were drowned in Nantes called the Noyade um, as the counter-revolution uh, put down the royalist uprising brutally. They would put them on ships and, um, and then drop them uh, into the Loire River and um, often had like rocks and stuff tied to them so that they drown. And it, a lot of like innocent people, like children and infants were killed in these um, purges as well. The Revolutionary Army takes, uh, retakes Lyon, Marseille and significantly uh, Toulon as well. And that one was thanks to Napoleon who is now starting to make a name for himself. So why was France winning the war now? Uh, so the European powers, they, the quote is, they feared their subjects almost as much as they feared their enemy. Um, unlike revolutionary France, they refused to appeal to their masses of people and make the war a popular fight for fear that their own monarchies would be overthrown. Maria de Pain said, uh, for the French Republic, it was a war to the death. And then the factions start to intensify. Debates really arose around whether to continue the terror, whether to continue with de-Christianization. Uh, the Jacobins wanted to have a, um, a very strange religion that they made up that was based on the uh, principles of the Enlightenment um, called the Cult of the Supreme Being. Um, and there were a lot of demands uh, for um, the demands of the popular movement. There was a lot of debate around what, what to do with that as well. So two factions in the convention were now arising between the indulgence, the indulgent, or the herbatists. Um, one was anti-populism, one was pro-populism, right and left, basically. The Committee of Public Safety veered right and left. They were unsure who to ally with. The tensions of the Jacobins, uneasy alliance with the sans culotte was really starting to show. And... If you can't decide who to ally with, why not just kill them all? So that's basically what the Jacobins did. They uh, decided to kill the herbatists first. They rounded them up and executed them. And then six days later, they killed all of the indulgent. So uh, problem solved. <laughs> um, meanwhile, there was still a war on. The war started out badly. It kind of died down in the winter. And then it started badly when it sprang back up in the spring. Um, then there was an assassination attempt on Robespierre um, and Debois. And uh, whether it was retaliation against that assassination attempt or whether it was due to the need to continue a royalist purge to prevent counter-revolution, for whatever reason, another two and a half thousand people were killed, uh, were sent to the guillotine over two months. Um, nobles and foreigners were banned from Paris. The terror continued. Uh, on the 26th of June, France won the Battle of Fleurus and the enemies retreated and the revolutionary government no longer had an excuse for its revolutionary measures. Um, they had made a lot of those revolutionary measures saying like, well, we need to do this because the war is on. And so now that there was no war really to focus on, 
the chickens could now come home to roost. And roost they did with the fall of Robespierre and the Jacobins. So the war was really looking good and um, they really began to look again at these political divisions. The Marsh, Marsh had become increasingly resentful of the revolutionary government. Robespierre and his comrades wanted to curb the terror and roll back some of the economic controls that they had placed um, on the economy. And mysteriously, Robespierre kind of goes silent and he makes very few appearances towards the beginning of the summer of 94. Um, some historians suggest that maybe he had a nervous breakdown. It's not really clear, clear what happened. But in his absence, all of his enemies began to kind of conspire against, against him. He became an easy scapegoat. They said, you know, like, well, it's all Robespierre's fault. Everything that's going wrong, we can blame it on him. So uh, on July 26, Robespierre finally comes out of hiding and he calls for the expulsion of all the terrorists who are threatening unity. Um, but he refuses to name names, but everybody knows who he's talking about. And the two that he's talking about are kicked, kicked out of the Jacobin Club and they fear that they will be executed. And so they conspire with the Marsh to plan a counterattack on Robespierre and his comrades. That's a rad image of the death mask of Robespierre. <laughs> And um, so on July 27th, Talien and Collot de Bois, um, they interrupt the convention while Robespierre and Saint-Just attempt to speak. They make a motion to arrest Robespierre and Saint-Just and Robespierre's, Robespierre the Younger um, and so on. Uh, the prison wardens refuse to um, imprison them at first and their supporters march on city hall. And the leaders really vacillate about what to do, but eventually they decide in order to save themselves, they need to execute these guys. So at 2 a.m. on the 28th of July, a, a force loyal to the convention enters City Hall. Some of Robespierre's supporters manage to commit suicide. Robespierre tries to commit suicide, but he only manages to shoot his jaw and shatter it. Uh, and then that's why he has the um, handkerchief around his face in that photo. Um, and then he was executed along with the rest of his compatriots that hadn't escaped or committed suicide. Um, in the end, 71 Jacobins were executed. Then you have the Thermidorian reaction. So this all happened during the month of Thermidor in the revolutionary calendar, which is a strange calendar that the revolutionaries came up with um, to kind of restructure everyone's concept of time. So they came to pa power and uh, likewise, the bourgeoisie reasserts power at the same time. So the government veers sharply back to the right, but they can't dismantle the gains of the revolution because it would mean a return to the social order that they also fought to overthrow. Um, so the Jacobin Club is closed. Um, eventually all those that conspired against Robespierre are also arrested. Um, so they tried to save themselves by killing Robespierre, didn't really work. Um, and then without bourgeois support, um, as they had with the Jacobin, the agitations of the Sans-Culottes and other populists start to really lose steam. The Thermidorians create the Directory, which is a, a, composed of two councils, the Council of 500 and the Council of Elders. And it's really a consolidation of bourgeois power because of the way that they structured it, um, making it difficult for people to be elected to it. Um, and then the new order basically just remains chronically unstable after that. And who can bring stability in that instable, instable, unstable situation? Well, it's this guy. Uh, so Napoleon had totally consolidated a lot of his power as well by um, making a lot of military wins. Um, France increasingly comes under military control and it's really as Robespierre prophetically predicted. He said, slack in the reins. Oh, that's a, <laughs> a typo that should say reins, uh, R-E-I-N-S, of the revolution for one moment and you shall see a military dictatorship, which is exactly what happened. Um, Napoleon secures his power in 1804, is declared the end of the revolution and Napoleon crowns himself emperor. However, the Code of Napoleon combines a lot of the principles of 1789, albeit with an emphasis on property rights. There's now a unified nation state. Feudal structures have ended. Wages are higher than before the revolution. The revolution inspires other uprisings against monarchies across Europe. Things stabilize uh, and the old order is no more. Industrial capitalism comes to the fore. Uh, there's a section in the uh, article that talks about Babeuf and others who begin to contemplate distributive communism. So it really paves the way for people to start thinking about other kinds of social structures, um, other ways of distributing wealth. Um, and then the bourgeois gains endure, which paves the way for the next era of class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the nascent proletariats, um, pro proletarians rather. Uh, and that proved that the revolution was necessary for social change. That was the big takeaway that Marx took from the revolution was that it really showed how a revolutionary, revolution is necessary for, um, for massive social change. And 
Uh, Babeuf said the French Revolution is only the forerunner of another greater, more serious and impressive revolution, which will be the last. He said that right before his execution. And the legacy of the French Revolution has continued and persisted ever since, and the struggle continues. I will leave the discussion of how historians have interpreted the revolution from a Marxist perspective for the discussion because that was enough to, <laughs> to cover right there. Yeah, that was a really awesome presentation, I gotta say. <laughs>